I now welcome you all back for the final panel of the day. Uh, we will uh, dare a switch of perspective uh, uh, at the, in the uh, third panel today and uh, we'll talk uh, about and exchange views on musical archives and their accessibility on transcultural composition and we will address the question of looted music that uh, Sandeep has touched uh, in his uh, keynote uh, before in reference to the dis current discussion of looted art and restitution of objects to the communities of their heritage. I particularly welcome the panelists via Zoom, uh, the Bolivian composer Carlos Gutierrez and uh, the Philippine-born musicologist and composer Mele Yamomo. And on site, here, I welcome the Brazil-born music ethnologist Tiago de Oliveira Pinto and uh, the music ethnologist Lars Christian Koch. Thank you all very much for your participation. Let me say some words to open the field and why we address this topic of archives in the context of curation, decolonization and diversity. Control of the archive, as the German literary and cultural scientist Aleida Assmann has already expressed on various occasions, implies control of memory. Archives are expressions of power structures and the content and interpretation of the archival materials is controlled by the canon of the system in power. Or with Jacques uh, Derrida, there is no political power without control over the archives, without control over memory. The archive is a knowledge, a collective knowledge system that fulfills various functions where three characteristics play a special role. Conversation, selection and accessibility. Thus, archives are always finite, exclusive and limited. We shall look more into these aspects of exclusiveness in the panel. Our focus today lies on sound and music archives related to non-Western musical cultures, uh, European archives and musical collections which date back to the early times of recordings in the late 19th century and which are often connected to unjust or violent colonial contexts. These archives store a great variety of musical practices of oral and collective memory systems. We will in this context have to address criteria of selection and authenticity and the circumstances of the recordings in relation to the communities of their heritage. Another question is how to deal with intertwined histories and the immateriality of sound and music. The theme of the panel leads us to some ethical, philosophical and practical questions regarding the handling of archives of music recorded in a colonial context. For some years now, there has been a strong demand for the restitution of art objects from European collections to communities of their origin. Today, we would like to discuss this question in the context of music. What status music recordings have in museums collections today? What is the significance of these collections for the communities of heritage? Which claims are they articulating? And what dialogues have to be conducted between the institutions and the communities? And what visions of change should we have in mind? And what impact this postcolonial process has on changes in the contemporary music field with regards to diversity? I would like to now uh, um, um, ask the four panelists to uh, contribute their statements or uh, uh, describe their uh, practices. And I would like to introduce as the first speaker of the panel, Carlos Gutierrez, composer and since last year, artistic director of the OEIN, the Orchestra Experimental dos Instrumentos Nativos, which was founded in 1980 by the Bolivian composer Sergio Prudencio. Carlos Gutierrez has been working with the orchestra as musician, researcher and co uh, composer and uh, um, has been researching uh, the sound characteristics and instruments of indigenous people of the Ant since several years. 
In 2018, he was guest of the DAD Artist in Berlin program and realized together with visual artist Tatjana Lopez a sound installation in the DAD gallery and the Donau Eschinger Musiktage. This year, the OEN was invited to open the festival Merz Musik in Berlin in close collaboration with the vocal ensemble Phoenix 16 which due to the corona uh, virus had to be cancelled and some of you might know that the whole orchestra was trapped in Rheinsberg for almost three months. The music of the indigenous communities in Bolivia is central to all of Carlos' compositions and uh, work. Uh, Carlos is joining us now from La Paz in Bolivia. Hello Carlos. Uh, I pass the word to you and uh, would like to ask you to introduce your work and uh, also your uh, work on archives here in Europe and uh, in Bolivia. Please. Thank you, Julia. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Okay, I will uh, talk briefly about uh, the experience of the experimental orchestra of indigenous instruments, uh, named in English. <laughs> Um, which is a mu musical ensemble founded in 1980 and based on the practice uh, of indigenous musical traditions and with all this knowledge, uh, technical knowledge and philosophical knowledge, the projection into the creation of contemporary music, of new music. Um, I'm currently the director of the orchestra and uh, one of the main goals that we uh, define with the whole group is uh, to become in a space of cultural reflection. Uh, we developed during this year, we developed uh, se several initiatives related to, to education. For example, we have an educational program for children in which we, we teach them uh, their first training, musical training through uh, indigenous music and indigenous instruments. We also developed a uh, residency program for composers. We had composers from South America and from Europe composing from, uh, for our ensemble. And uh, we also developed di different uh, ways of link with indigenous communities. Uh, within Bolivia. And uh, since we're talking of archive, I would like to share with you a very uh, turning point experience for us in this uh, um, um, sense, in this area. We've been collecting, a few years ago, we've been collecting a, a, a documentation uh, because we started a research, research process collective research process about a, a, a very ancient uh, style of music developed in a small village uh, eight hours from La Paz, which is uh, the city where we lived. So we collected different documents, transcripts, and the texts, uh, most of them made by uh, European uh, researchers. And uh, we didn't have any audio recording so I found out through this text that there was this uh, French anthropologist, Louis Giraud, uh, who lived in Bolivia in the mid uh, 20th century and made a lot of recordings of music. So I found out that uh, there were two audio recordings of this music, which is called Tuayu. Uh, so I uh, found that all this music of all this collection uh, were in the, um, National Library of France. So I contacted them and they told me it was impossible to have access to this collection via internet. Uh, so co coincidentally, I was in 2015 uh, nearby. So I decided to go to the, to the library and ask about these recordings. Uh, they told me that it's, it's not possible to have a copy of all these uh, recordings. Uh, no, they told me that it's possible, but the, the, the price to have recordings, the, 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 there was a rate uh, of seconds that you can have, it was very high uh, to pay for me in that time. So what I did, it was to, uh, I asked them to, to listen to the recordings because I, I could do that. And uh, they put me in this little room 
with a couple of speakers and screen. And I play all the music that I could. And when I found these examples of, of Twayu, of this old ancient music that we were researching, uh, I put on my tablet, I put recording and, and I stay quiet. So, so I'm confessing probably an illegal act that I did, but I'm not regretted all of that. We, uh, then I came back from there um, to Bolivia and with the orchestra, we tried to reconstruct these examples with our uh, instruments. We had uh, among all the material, we found like seven transcriptions and plus these two recordings, we found uh, nine tunes of this kind of music. So we decided to go to the community, uh, which is called Upinguaya. Uh, and we decided to go the day before the main celebration. The main celebration uh, is in July 25th and the celebrations in countryside, they are often related to saints. So the main celebration in this case, it was related to the Saint uh, Tata Santiago, which is a Spanish image figure saint uh, that indigenous people mix it with the image and with the representation of the thunder. So it, it is related with the, with the you know, God of the thunder. So they did, indigenous people did, uh, to prevent the Spaniards to destroy this representation, this image. Uh, they camouflaged it in that way. Um, so we went there with all these tunes, you know, we practiced all these tunes and uh, we got there and they told us that the celebration got canceled that year because uh, one of the members of the family that was in charge of the celebration because every year it's a different family who, was in who is in charge of the celebration, one of the members passed away. So it was a very sad news for, for us, of course, for the whole circumstances. But anyway, we stayed there and we decided to play uh, in, in that night that we arrived, we play you know, publicly uh, some of the tunes that we brought. And it was a very... Uh, impressive experience because we had this gathering of many people from the community and uh, with, with the, you know, uh, shocked faces, uh, not uh, believing really why these people from the city, they, they know about this old ancient music that they stopped play uh, more or less in the 70s. So I remember this comment of this lady who approached us and told us that she remember her father used to play this music and uh, the tempo, the remark on the tempo, she told us that uh, we, we were playing kind of fast and the tempo well, well, was uh, slower than that. That was the, the first uh, uh, remark and approach that we, we had and it was amazing because we work over the recording. And then uh, and the next day, a, a couple of old men approached to us and they decided to join the group because they used to play this music. They teach us a couple of new tunes. And then the authorities of the community they asked us to play in the main ritual of the celebration because the whole community decided to um, start the celebration, to restart the celebration on that day. So what we did was play uh, for the main ritual that is take the saint, this Tata Santiago saint out of the little church and make uh, him, you know, just pass through the four corners of the main plaza, main place. And uh, we play for that. And, and the people prepare different kinds of food. They started the party and we play for the party. And most of them told us that we brought back their uh, historic memory again. And most of them told us that probably is this saint, this Tata Santiago, brought uh, or sent us to them with this music. Uh, from then on, we had a, a very nice relationship with them. We recorded new versions of the whole, tu the whole tunes plus the new tunes that they, they uh, teach us. The state made an official recognition of this music uh, be belonging to this community. Uh, so that was a turning point for us in the sense that we decided from then on to create an archive which will be uh, the base of these different initiatives. But this, um, uh, you know, the process of create this archive for us 
uh, it had to have this criteria of not just accumulate uh, material without context and uh, different other questions that we probably we will talk about in this talk. Uh, and I, I will mention a few questions that came across this, this process. Um, for example, who should, who should have the rights of these old recordings? Um, should open archive really be open to everyone? There have to be some criteria, criteria about it. Uh, it is necessary to rethink in our ways of networking and collective contribution to archives. We need to think in new ways of indexing, for example. Uh, and contextualized archives can help states and institutions change the way they understand the, their cultural heritages, understand, for example, that indigenous music and dance are historical representations of different forms of influences between cultural groups, trading, production chains, technology, etc. So for us, it was a, 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 a turning point, as I said, and a, made us to think also in this another uh, fundamental part of our work as a musical orchestra as and also as a space of cultural reflection as i said thank you very much uh, uh, carlos uh, for this very uh, interesting uh, um, yeah, uh, story or interconnected uh, um, way how the recording uh, came from Bolivia to Europe and then back. And uh, now is the initiative for um, creating an archive in uh, Bolivia, in La Paz. Um, we sure will come back to the questions that you just mentioned uh, uh, at the end. Uh, you uh, wrote such a nice, such so, so a wonderful word that I cannot uh, pronounce exactly with uh, amus the the um, remembering what it uh, what is forgotten amus can you can you uh, pronounce it in your text Carlos do you uh, hear me amutasanya yeah can you say something about uh, the concept behind it because remembering what is forgotten in one word. Uh, uh, what does it imply as a metaphor? Well, it's the beginning of, of it's, it's all in the idea of an archive. It's a word that we found, it's, it's funny because it's a word that we didn't uh, found in the common mother language, Aymara language. We found that word in a very old, in the first dictionary, Spanish Aymara that Ludovico Bertonio, a monk, uh, made in the uh, century, in the 17th century, I, if I'm not uh, wrong. And uh, it, it means that, you know, to bring back something that was forgotten. And uh, it's, uh, of course, it's, it's kind of the main fundamental philosophy behind this archive, because we want to develop different uh, projects related uh, to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very, very much, Carlos. Thank you. Uh, as second speaker, I now uh, welcome Professor uh, uh, Tiago de Oliveira Pinto here on site, ne sitting next to me. He is a chairholder on uh, transcultural music studies at the University of Music uh, Franz Liszt in Weimar and head of its joint musicology department with Friedrich Schiller University Jena. Pinto has carried out musicological fieldwork in Brazil, Portugal, Turkey, Southeast Asia, Mozambique, Tanzania, and South Africa. He has curated art and anthropological exhibitions, produced records and organized music festivals and cultural events. He is director of the Afghanistan Music Research Center, a project that was founded in 2012 in collaboration with institutions in Afghanistan and is also an archive project. And he has frequently in the last years been involved in discussions about restitution. For example, last year in the context of a conference in Windhoek, Namibia by the Goethe Institute. I'm very happy that you were able to join us here today. 
and pass on the word to uh, tell us something uh, from your perspective uh, on uh, this uh, archive and uh, restitution topic. Thank you very much. Is it working? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here. In fact, you mentioned Namibia, and I looked to, to Lars Koch. This was the last time we met, so <laughs> we are here again together discussing interesting topics. I was very much inspired today by, by, by these other panels. And just a few uh, uh, words on, on what I'm doing. My background is that of a musician as a, a child and a youngster. My starting point is in Brazil, and I have um, an ba uh, artistic background. My parents, both of them, have been very active in the field of visual arts, not music, but visual arts. Since 2009, you mentioned it, uh, Julia, I'm the head of the chair on transcultural music studies at uh, the University of Music, Franz Liszt in Weimar, here in Germany. Uh, music research, and you see this is, sorry, uh, this, is, uh, it, this was quite a new thing in 2009. Uh, our colleagues from ethnomusicology know that it, it, it was not a, it's not a chair of ethnomusicology, it's a chair uh, on transcultural music studies, it's another kind of approach. So music research at our, at our place is conceptualized as the applied study of music as belonging to a living heritage. So we start from the sound, from music that is being uh, produced now. So it fits wonderful to our event here. Sounds now, this is what we do, this is our interest. And so we are not departing from scores or from, from, uh, from materials in, in archives. Of course, they are important. When we, when we do research, of course, we, we rely on them also. But uh, the, the, the first focal point is music that is sounding now. So it's contemporary music also, in a way. Um, <clears throat> but music is intangible. It's an intangible cultural output, and as such, it is a completely different entity than material artifacts that can be displayed behind uh, glass in showcases. This is another issue we, we are very active in working with museums, uh, and this was also the topic of our meeting in Namibia. Uh, how can uh, countries with museums with little or even no classical collections display, uh, make visible to, to the people their living heritage. This goes, of course, much beyond music and dance. Um, due to this academic approach of our chair, uh, it has been promoted in 2016 to a UNESCO chair in transcultural music, so, uh, music studies, so we are the first, I think, still the only UNESCO chair in the field of musicology. And we work very, very close to the section on the intangible cultural heritage of UNESCO and, um, and uh, this approach of music as a living heritage is so interesting, so important for musicology because you probably know uh, this UNESCO convention from 2003 for the safeguarding of the intangible cultural heritage there is this UNESCO representative list, and if you have a closer look, you will see that almost 70% of those manifestations and issues on this list, inscribed uh, on this list, are 70% are music or issues, manifestations related to music. So this is a huge... A, a, a huge amount of, of, diver, of musical diversity. And uh, the main thing, and, and we, 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 we believe on that, is that uh, the, what the, the UNESCO Convention says, that it's, it's the duty of the cultural bearers to decide what is their cultural heritage and what not. It's not our uh, issue as, um, as scholars. And uh, methodologically, this implies also that we don't work as has been done in ethnomusicology in the past from 
this ethnographical perspective. We are not doing ethnography because uh, this is, is very asymmetrical. The relation between this relation between researcher and uh, researched is very asymmetrical. And since we believe that both musicians, researchers, I would say also curators, promoters, have each of them has an own perspective and interest in the music. So we try to come together and do this kind of what we call collaborative research. I give you some examples of my of my work. You mentioned we we established this Afghan Music Center together with institutions in Afghanistan. This started in 2012, yes. And um, the interesting thing here is that's not an archive which came out or, or which was created or, or with, with uh, uh, musical artifacts, with recordings that were collected here. No, this is the archive of the uh, Afghan uh, radio TV Afghanistan. So these are recordings from the 50s and 60s. And this, you know, of course, the struggle Afghanistan has witnessed this past uh, many decades now. It's uh, really the only really big and large cultural archive in Afghanistan. And they approached us to, in order to digitize and to, to, uh, to think about a method of how organizing, how, how, coming to, how to come closer to the content, and so on and so on. But they would never allow to say, one of my colleagues said, OK, great, just send us the, the magnetic tapes and we have all, we have our equipment here, we, we digitize this for you. No, that's not possible. You can't, they would never allow to send these magnetic old tapes out of Afghanistan, even if they are really in danger, physically endangered. Not only because the tapes are old, but of course, due to the situation we all know. So this is one in very interesting project, and it has an, an artistic side also. If you, if you go into our YouTube channel of the Franz Liszt University, you will see a lot of examples of artistic performances with musicians from there, from the ANIM, from the Afghan National Institute of Music uh, projects, with our students, uh, with uh, colleagues from me who went there and made music with them together, a lot of things happening uh, and going much beyond questions, scholarly questions of an archive. Another interesting uh, project we are starting now, unfortunately we had to stop because of the pandemic, is working with communities in Colombia and Brazil. And uh, because these communities share something which is their African background. And you can't believe, but there is no contact between Bolivia and Brazil. The, the communities who have their musical traditions in Northeast and Brazil uh, have no idea what is going on in Colombia. So information, I studied here in Berlin. For me, this uh, ibero Americanisches Institute, this library was wonderful because here in Europe, I could have informations from the whole of Latin America. In Brazil, this would be impossible. It's hard for me to get uh, this kind of information, even from a country which may, has its border to my country. So uh, this is another topic. This, uh, to, to our duty as a chair, as a UNESCO chair, is to, to help and to put forward projects that uh, have in mind this South-South relation because it's always south to the north and the north to the south. But this direct connection, this case between communities in Colombia and communities in Brazil, this is something really new. And we intend even to make uh, uh, um, symposia and, and uh, events like this, even academic, uh, of a, an academic character, in the communities themselves also, and try to find this, this um, uh, this connection. Another is, uh, issue regarding music as intangible cultural heritage and the problem which is so much discussed about repatriation. I had personally, this was in the 90s, working for the International Institute of Traditional Music, 
I discovered a, a, a gentleman in, in Bonn here in Germany who spent 20 years of his life in the 50s and 60s among uh, people in Amazonia, Aparai. He was not a researcher, but he lived there with, the, with those people, and he was very interested in their culture and made a lot of recordings of oral history of music and so on and so on. And as working at this institute, I said, we must give, we must repatriate this material to them. This was completely new in 1994 or something like that. People are discussing this now, 10, 15 years ago. Well, it was a hard work to get financed this project and so on and so on and so on. At the end, I could reach this, uh, this um, the main village of the Aparai in the northern, close to the border to Suriname, the forest. And I had a box with tape, with cassettes. I knew they have a thing. So we went to the main house with the chiefs and so on. We gave them the cassettes, and, uh, and me as a scholar said, oh, I did a great job. I, I, I saved the historic memory of this group, similar to what Carlos was saying. So, but these people, they don't recognize this. They listen to the music and said, well, but where are the movements? This story he is telling, I have only, I need the gestures of this story. I need the movement of this. This has no value for us. You see, uh, so this, is, uh, this was a very interesting uh, experience. Uh, it's not just sending them recordings back, you know. This is why I think the work with, uh, with those uh, cultural barriers is important. Another thing, let's look into here, into Germany. Uh, as um, Sandeep has mentioned this, music theory, music history, what are we doing the Franz Liszt University of Music? There's a course in my department, music before 1600, music for 1600. I asked my colleague, 1600 what? Apples or what? Music before 1600. And, ah, okay, the year 1600 before, uh, after Christ. So, but music by whom? Music where in the world? So you see musicology, historical musicology, has organized music history in a way like music theory also. And this is a really, it, this is a problem we are facing as, as scholars. And I think at, at decolon, a, a way of thinking, the way I think of decolonizing this kind of approach to music history is using some strategies. Because if in the course, say, student must make these this seminars, music before 1600, I was offering a course about music and shamanism. I said, shamanism and music is much older than 1600. So those who are studying with me, they can apply and get the credit for this thing, you see? <laughs> so we have to have our strategies. And uh, a main problem of, of also with my colleagues with musicology, you all know this, is that this aerologic uh, way of thinking, that music must be complex, the complexity. This is what European music is like, the complexity and the other things. Oh, this is only rhythm, this is too simple. And, uh, but th this is really a problem, and even organizers and curators um, they behave this way. I just heard recently from a friend from Uganda, from this uh, Ugandan uh, uh, orchestra, this, this former court music from Uganda. They had a performance in the Maison de Culture du Monde, which is, an, which is a, a serious institution in Paris. And the organizer said, uh, because they, they brought some women to dance, no, please. Don't, don't, don't dance in this performance because we want that our audience listen to the complexity of your music. And this dance, you know, this is nowadays, this happened nowadays, it's amazing. And for them, this was, uh, this was very strange. Another thing, I think you mentioned it, Sandeep, uh, when the ritual becomes a concert, and the question is the loss of concert, sorry, and the question if the loss of context is also the loss of cultural signification. I don't think it's a loss. There is maybe a, a shift, a change. Another example here from the House of Kultur und der Welt, together with 
Johannes Odenthal, who is your colleague now, unfortunately he's not here. We had, they had a, a festival in transit, I don't know if, if you saw this, uh, of contemporary performance. And uh, I had a group of indigenous people from the Amazonia, 25 Chavanti. It was important for me to bring them here in those days. I was uh, the head of the Brazilian Cultural Institute and the Brazilian government uh, were uh, uh, having their celebrations for 500 years of Brazil and nothing about those who have been there much before these 500 years. And so I said, I must bring them here. And we had 25 Chavantes from the Amazon forest here in Berlin. And Johannes and I said, oh, but that, that's a problem to have Indians on stage. This is exoticism. We can't do that. But we can offer them to make a workshop. Yes, not on stage. Please don't put them on stage. I went there and I talked to my friends, Chavances, and, and the one they had asked, Well, I see here the program. What about this performance group from Japan or for Belgium? Are they also offering only a workshop? I said, No, they are on stage. Okay, we want to be on stage also. Where's the problem? You see? Uh, so uh, this is, and it was a great performance. It was just, uh, it was just uh, fantastic. And in a contemporary festival, this is also contemporary. This is music and dance being done now, nowadays. So this was a great, great experience also. So I'm just uh, closing just to, to add something about academia, where I belong to in a way. And I must say, also in this context, um, academia is still very, a very strong colonizer. Why the hell are we discussing in English here? English is my fourth language. I'm much more comfortable to discuss with you in Portuguese or in German. You know, it's not a critic. It's just we have to be aware of that. What about those who, who can't speak, who can't uh, uh, tell you something in this free manner I'm trying to do, and it is a problem. Another thing is I spent uh, as a visiting scholar in the US, and it's typical, you know this from the Anglo-American uh, uh, academia, a colleague comes to, oh, my, my recent book has just been published. So the question is, which editor? Oxford University Press. Who in Africa, in South America, is able to publish anything in Oxford University Press? So you see, there is a very, very strong colonial way of, of behaving in the academia. It was, for me, it was funny. I would ask my colleague, oh, new book, great, what are you talking about? What, what is the issue in your book? No, the question was, which editor? And this is what... what what gives value to the world. Well, these are just some few remarks to what I'm doing, to where I am, and I hope to continue discussion now. Thank you very much, Tiago, for these uh, many uh, um, um, experiences that you have made and many perspectives that you have uh, uh, brought on the table, to the top of the table uh, in these uh, experiences. Um, uh, we will come back to uh, questions uh, later on the, in the panel discussion. Um, we now uh, address uh, again uh, a panelist in the Zoom. Um, I welcome Mili Yamomo. He is Assistant Professor of Theatre Performance and Sound Studies at the University of Amsterdam. He is a sound artist and researcher and has been challenging archival practices in European institutions like the Ethnological Museum in Dahlem concerning access and agency. He has been resident in the Theatre Ballhaus Naunin Straße in Berlin, which is known for its post-colonial approach, where he presented last year his performative sound installation Echoing Europe Postcolonial Reverberations. His PhD was about opera in Southeast Asia, and this work, wo work was a turning point in his research career. He current, is currently initiating different research and artistic projects on European archives, partly together with Asian artists. And I now pass on the word to Mele Yamomo. Please.
as a performance and sound maker, I engage myself in epistemic and disciplinary egress from music and theater towards the decolonial possibilities of sound and performance. We see and hear parallel paradigmatic shifts in other cultural and art disciplines since the 1970s. Anthropologist Victor Turner and theater scholar Richard Schechner, who were interested in studying performance cultures beyond the confines of theater, started what we now call performance studies. Jen Berger, WJT Mitchell, and Hans Belting were instrumental in the move towards visual and image studies. When I speak of discipline, I speak on the one hand of artistic and academic discipline. On the other hand, I speak of discipline as policing. The cultural and economic capital of disciplines are maintained through the, discipli the disciplining of the bodies of its creators, practitioners, and consumers, and in the policing of what are considered valuable by ac academies, encyclopedias, museums, festivals, and archives. Decolonization to me is an act of epistemic disobedience. The literary scholar Walter Mignolo coined this term. Colonialism is epistemic because it is deeply embedded in our knowledge system. It manifests in our theorization of the world around us, in our aesthetics, and in the cultural practice we deem appropriate or important to include in museums, archives, and festivals. These epistemologies are formed and codified in disciplines. The discipline of music and its theoretical component in musicology and its non-European counterpart in ethnomusicology, as well as drama and its theorization in theater studies have institutionalized academic disciplines and disciplining. Whereas performance, visual and sound studies turned its analysis towards modes of perception and production as part of bigger and social cultural processes beyond art academies and institutions. These new frameworks allowed for epistemic turns through which we can reframe cultural processes outside the way the white, male, cis, heterosexual, and ableist hegemonies that previous artistic canons and institutions prohibited. My current research and artistic project called Sonic Entanglements um, I examined sound recordings taken in Southeast Asia between 1900 to 1950. For this project, I consult the sound collection of the Berlin Phonogram Archive, the Berlin Sound Archive, the Vienna Phonogram Archive, the Japkunst Archive, the Dutch Institute for Sound and Vision, the Center for Ethnomusicology in Paris, and the British Library sound collection. I am interested in considering the sound archive as the primary source of colonial historiography. Um, and in doing so, by switching the sense from legibility of the eyes to the audibility of the ears, I aim to transpose reading history to listening history. During my bachelor's study at the University of the Philippines in the late 1990s, we studied the taxonomy of performative practices in Southeast Asia, wherein theater scholar James Brandon labeled certain performative practices as proto-dramatic. This thinking assumes that European theater tradition, particularly Victorian drama, 
is the Darwinist criterion through which all other performative cultures are evolving to become. In reframing my practice to, towards performance and sound, I aim to collapse hierarchies and distinctions seeded to theater and music and place them within a vertical framework in placing different performance and sound traditions democratically. My name is Mileya Momo. I grew up in the Philippines where I studied theater making, music composition, and art history. 12 years ago, I came to Europe to study a master's in international performance research through an Erasmus Mundus scholarship. In this program, I studied in three different universities, the University of Amsterdam, the University of Warwick in the UK, and the University of Tampere in Finland. In each country, we studied a modality of knowledge, research, artistic practice, and curation. From this experience, I became acutely aware of the entanglements of how knowledge is simultaneously theorized, performed, and curated or archived. You are done. <laughs> Hi, Julia. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mele, for the performance and uh, uh, the uh, uh, the ideas that you presented. And uh, um, because of the time, I I pass on directly to uh, Lars Christian Koch, the last speaker of the panel. He is uh, the director of the ethnologic Neurological Museum and the Museum of Asian Art of the Staatliche Museum to Berlin. He has been a researcher and musician for uh, decades, uh, has been traveling a lot and uh, especially in India. And uh, he is in charge uh, of the well-known Phonogram Archive that Mele just mentioned with uh, many recordings, over 150,000 recordings of non-Western sounds and music. And uh, 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 Lars Christian Koch is uh, at the beginning, at, at the moment, preparing uh, the big move of the um, collection into the Humboldt Forum and uh, working on the conceptualization of how to work with this uh, big uh, collection in the future. And uh, I pass on the word and we are very curious about what's going to happen in the future. Nice introduction and thanks for being here. Um, the Phonogram Archive and the um, exhibition of sound in the Humboldt Forum is one part of my, uh, my business. Um, I was head of the department uh, since 2003 and then for more than 10 years. Now I'm director of these two museums, so this is only a part of what I'm looking into at the moment and I think this is important because in the museum in, in Dahlem and later on in the Humboldt Forum, we have this topic of colonialism, of repatriation through, throughout the whole collection. And for me, sound, the sound collection is a very specific topic in, in this relationship because I really think that um, immaterial culture or intangible heritage is not addressed really properly what it really means in the sense of being objects, of being something which has value which has also cultural value in the sense of memory. I will come to these topics a little bit later. I will just uh, discuss uh, four points which are really important for me in this connection, especially if you just come, come back to the main topic of this panel, to looted music and accessibility. Um, I think we can also discuss what we really mean if you just address it as looted music. I will just explain how the phonogram archive actually started. It started out of uh, curiosity in the sense of psychology of music. Um, Karl Stumpf and Erich Moos von Hornbosse, they wanted to understand how mankind is listening. Do, they, do we all listen in the same way? Do we have all the same criteria on music, on sound? At this time, it was possible to record sound. Recording sounds means you can just 
Um, we produce it constantly and again and again, so you can make transcriptions, you can just analyze it, you can get your uh, research questions solved if you are just um, precise in, in your methods. So they, they started to collect as many recordings as possible. They started in Berlin, pretty interesting. They started in 1900 in September here in Berlin at, uh, at the zoo. And it was a human zoo. They were just recording um, a theater group from Thailand. And they continued here in Berlin. Then suddenly they realized that there are a lot of expeditions, people going outside of Berlin. So they just got recording equipment to make recordings on these expedition trips. It ended up in a collection with more than 30,000 wax cylinders, 16,000 originals throughout the world, and these are all original so-called field recordings. This is important in the connection, as they call this untouched music, authentic music, or traditional music. I will come to this term a little bit later again. Um, they wanted to have um, music and recordings which had no influence from the outside. It's a very specific perception of culture during this time they had. They wanted to save the cultures, they wanted to save the sound. Local rights uh, were not, a, and legal rights were not a really, really a topic at this moment. They just made recordings. We're talking about 1900 to 1950. At the same time, you had a second strain, and this is the so-called commercial strain, or commercial track. Commercial recordings also started worldwide around 1900. The first recordings made in India were made in 1902. They were so-called recording trips of commercial institutions in the West, and it just took less than 10 years till they had um, a pressing unit in Kolkata, in Damdam, and the HMV at this time, it was called HMV, later on EMI, they took over the whole distrib the distribution of Asia. It just took them five years and they had in their catalog more than 10,000 recordings, commercial recordings, I must mention. And even during this time, it was a straight business. With these um, recording journeys, um, they were paying the, the musicians, they, some of them were well paid. Um, they made a lot of profit out of the whole uh, situation, definitely. And again, legal rights were no topic. This is something which comes in later. We are talking uh, who does this music belong to. And I would just cut it v very short. This is really a very complicated topic. Even nowadays, it's not, uh, not as easy as it seems. During this time, um, the concept, and this is up to now, the concept was individual-based. You had a composer. You had something like an opus. Something you created. Very important. This was the concept of composition. We had individual creativity. This was not really addressed in the sense of, let's say, improvisation. Again, the terminology I will just come a little bit later. This was not considered as being a composition. The topic of copyright came in only in the sense of commercial recordings if you had a composer. So everything else was just more or less public domain in their understanding at this time. The ethical issues involved, that means that there is music which belongs to a community, which belongs to a culture, was also not discussed during this time. This all came later in the 90s and in 2000s, um, a topic we are discussing at the moment um, intensively. And this is the fourth point I would like to discuss, the contemporary discourse we had at, at the moment. We have this idea that, that music is something which belongs to, to mankind, which is something like universal. And the phonogram archive was the first institution in Germany becoming part of uh, UNESCO, a document of the memory of the world. So it's pretty interesting that we see these kind of collections as memory of the world. We have recordings from the Navajo community in, in North America, and 
the first time we just talked to them and mentioning this is your recordings are part of the memory of the world. And they said, so what? I mean, these are our recordings. It's not the world recordings. This is again um, an idea of getting your identity back out of these recordings. So this is a discourse which is just going on constantly. To whom does it belong? This involves digitization. It involves accessibility. And it involves repatriation. This is something we do in the Phonogram Archive um, for the last, let's say, 10, 15 years, that we publish recordings, historical recordings, together with our colleagues from the source communities. So they are selecting, they just write the, the liner notes, they give the certain value to the recordings, and then we publish it, we open it. Normally it will be in the way that half of the, the copies will go to the country of origin, and the other half will be here in, uh, in Europe, also for distribution. Um, I'll just give you one, one example from Palau, a former German um, protectorate or colony. Um, it was uh, UNESCO funded, so we invited our colleagues from the National Museum in Palau to come over to Berlin. So we made the selections of the recordings here. They were just writing the liner notes, again, in different languages. Um, Thiago just mentioned it. So we had Palau and we had English and German in this booklet. Um, they just worked on the recordings here because sometimes it's really important to, uh, to master a recording in the way that's understandable for the community. And then we sent 500 copies back. The other one, uh, the other half, stayed back in, in Germany. Um, we had um, we had done recordings from Brazil, two collections from from Peru, from from Tanzania, from Georgia, from Korea, and I could just go on. You know, it's um, every year one or two. The last one is from Armenia, prisoner of war camp recordings. We can also discuss about this topic because if you're talking about colonial context, this is definitely a huge collection being definitely out of colonial context. I will just come back to the legal issue we have. So if you're just considering the historical recordings as being public domain out to, um, concerning our legal system, that means it's older than 70 years, uh, you don't have a composer and so on, this is what it means. But we just are very restrictful in this sense because even if these recordings are public domain, the connected cultural memory is definitely not. And this is something we always have to address if you work with the source communities. And this again involves the strategies for the Humboldt Forum. Um, we will have the possibility there to, to exhibit sound. We have a, a very specific area only for listening. You, want, you don't see any objects in there. It's a room of uh, approximately 200 square meters with an ambisonic installation and the Wernfeld synthesis in installation so that we can present the recordings in cooperation with the source communities in these three-dimensional rooms. We can also invite artists from the communities to work on their collections history, on their cultural memory, to present it in a contemporary way. Uh, this is something, the last term I would just um, come to the, to the last topic, I would just make it a little bit shorter in the this, in this sense. Uh, we are almost in the Q&A session now. Yes, I would just, just two, two more sentences. Yeah. I would just give a, give a short um, uh, remark at, at, the, at the end. We we're just talking about all these um, terminologies like uh, trans-traditional, traditional, hybridity, um, contemporary, improvisation. These are, to me, all terminologies out of Western societies. They are colonial in certain ways, especially the term traditional is. And it's astonishing for me that we are just trying to decolonize, but still talking in these terminologies. I'll just give you one, one example, or maybe two. A traditional is, is something which shows that, or we should show that um, societies are static. They've always done it like this. I don't know any society which is. That's one point. We're talking about improvisation. It was already mentioned that I learned Indian music, and I didn't learn to improvise. I learned to permutate. And this is something which is very deeply involved in the society. If you talk about contemporary or something new, especially in Indian music, you don't create a new rag. You just don't, because they're all existing. So these concepts are very Western concepts, 
and Western terminology. And this is something we should also reflect if we're just talking about decolonization of sound, sound recordings. So it's a wide and open field. So if we're just keep giving only glimpses on, on certain topics, uh, I have to stop here because I think we have this question and answer, right? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Lars, mm -hmm. uh, Christian, for, uh, for your insight into the work of the Humboldt uh, Forum. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a question to Carlos and uh, uh, Millet. Um, um, you have heard now um, about two uh, German um, big, huge institutions, the, the museum uh, here and the Humboldt Forum, and also uh, uh, universities uh, and their approach. Um, do you agree with the with the uh, um, with the approach uh, that you have heard, or what would you um, give back uh, to the institutions uh, where to improve? Do you expect, uh, for example, Carlos? Do you expect that? Uh, um, the institutions in Europe um, support you in creating the archive um, and bringing together all the sparse, sparse uh, out uh, material in the different museums. Uh, what are your ex uh, what are your expectations of the institutions here? Well, thank you for the question, Julia. I think it's. Uh, it could be a complex situation. We are in, in our uh, project with the archive, we are also dealing with different, not only ethics, but legal uh, aspects of uh, how to um, just show uh, the music, show the archives. It, it is possible to do it. We have this example for, for, uh, for instance, we have this case of this uh, little label that used to record indigenous music in the 80s. And now the, this, the, the only guy who survived to uh, and have this collection is his own, uh, only way of living to sell the, this, the digitized version of these recordings. So we bought almost all the material that he has, that he recorded, and we were inco incorporating that in our archive. Uh, but the, the question is, now, if we published, for example, because we want to, this archive to be an online, uh, online archive, if we publish this, what's going to happen with this uh, main income? That is probably his only income, and uh, if, if it will be for free or something like that. So it, it can be, we are talking about that with him, it can be another uh, media of have an, 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 an income, you know, to, for the people who is interested in, in listen or download this music to have an income um, through uh, this, this platform. And I think with the, with, the, with the museums, there are a lot of issues on this, on this matter, uh, also these kind of matters. And what we expected, of course, is a, first of all, to have contact and uh, to talk about these different cases and um, uh, to generate networking. One of our goals in the creation of this uh, uh, platform is to have contributions uh, from every, you know, institutions and individuals that in some stage accumulate or made a recording uh, itself. So in that case, we are expecting that the relation uh, between institutes, we are not an, a, a consolidated institution. So, so we really want to have a dialogue uh, concerning probably each of these cases or related to each of these uh, record field recordings or what kind of uh, registers they have. So we, we will be always uh, open to work with all of them and to somehow it, can, it could sound uh, tricky, but could somehow to be the link between institutions or individuals uh, and communities, because uh, it happens also that most of the times communities doesn't know, as is the case of that community that I talked at the beginning of the talk, um, doesn't know about these uh, archives, these collections that have, uh, you know, music from them, from their own uh, 
heritage. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mili, um, you, are, you are, have been criticizing more the structure uh, of the, the institutions. Uh, um, what are your expectations to... Uh yeah, Th thank you, Julia. Um, I guess, uh, you know, um, indeed, my, I, do, I do have critiques about um, archivist institutions, um, particularly in Europe, both uh, both. In, in these three capacities, um, I as both as an academic, as a, as a scholar, and as a um, yeah, as, as a curator as well, because I, I'm I will be curating a festival in Berlin um, this coming next year. Um, I think that you know I'm I mean, in a sense I'm privileged to to be able to practice in, in these three different modalities. And I, we have actually recently just submitted a, propo a grant proposal, wherein we would be would like to work with different archives. Um, and, and unfortunately, Berlin is um, Germany is not included in this. But I'm I'm interested, for example, in how, um, on the one hand, um, we were talking about, um, you know, we were talking about these colonial practices. Um, so, um, in, in at the core of my question has always been not just access, because I think that the most fundamental question that we need to address is access, but access also um, um, entails diff many different things. And this, um, Tiago has mentioned this, you know, um, access is not just access to materials, but access even also where who, if, if, if anyone could even have access to these materials and want to write something, who gets to publish them in, in which, in where, you know? So, so access entails multiple things. So, I, and to me, there are three things, which is just access and agency. Agency means also that who, um, who gets, who has the power and who has the capacity, who has the agency to be able to speak in behalf of these objects um, and, 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 from, and, the, and the culture from which they're taken from. And finally, I think the most important thing is discourse. Who gets to determine the discourse you know, um, of, um, about this? Because I find that in the end, um, in my own research project that I have been questioning, um, I, you know, as probably one of the first um, um, scholar from, from Southeast Asia who, 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 who was able to come to Europe, and you know, um, I am now a, a European citizen, I'm working in the, in the European academ uh, academia, I find still that most most of the discourse in my region in Southeast Asia is still written by um, by European scholars, mostly white male, um, mostly heterosexual scholars. You know, and and this and, and my question here is not just in, in, it's it's it, it it entails these three things like who gets the access to these archival materials so that by accessing them they could eventually be able to they would have the agency to be able to um, direct the discourse about this because. If the discourse is still being taken over by um, by uh, by scholars here in Europe, then that's, that doesn't really change things. Um, so I think this is um, and, and and I think um, Lars and also Tiago are very aware of this. And uh, and actually, this is a question that I'm also interested in hearing from them. In how, um, what, uh, what, what, how do you see in the future um, your archives? Will be um, will be addressing this issue, particularly for me, the importance of the discourse of like how do we make sure that discourse is taken over by the communities from which they come from these um, sound materials. Uh, Lars, would you like to answer very briefly? I have a question in the chat, so uh, um, I, yeah. I was just asked, uh, answer said, and you too, yes, as you said. Um, all the publications we, we've done, either we um, had selections from the communities themselves or from our colleagues. Um, I'll just give you colleagues from the countries. I'll just give you one example from, uh, from, from Korea, South Korea, the prison of war camps recordings from Korean prisoners. Uh, we were approached by the Gugak Center in Seoul. They wanted to make this publication, so we worked with them, and it was their discourse. The Prison of War Camp recordings from Georgia. We worked with the Tbilisi Conservatory for Music. They also came over. They researched on the recordings. They dominated definitely the discourse. They were just writing the liner notes. We had uh, recordings from Southeast Europe. We had um, a team of, of researchers working on the recordings from the societies. And they again wrote the, the booklet and published it. I could just go mm -hmm. and get more and more uh, examples on this. Mm. This is for us really crucial that we are not dominating it here. 
that we work with our partners and with the source communities. Sometimes it's really interesting that you open up a field, and this is the last example we just published from Patagonia, the recordings from the CELCNAM, um, assuming that these um, community is extinct. So we worked with our colleague Miguel Garcia from Argentina, and last year I was invited to Bayonne to a conference on the CELCNAM. Suddenly they get reformed uh, again because they, they say, for example, my grandfather was a Sergnam and my grandmother was and so on, saying that our society, our community is living in the blood of others. So these things are belonging to us and they, would, they definitely took these recordings and taking it again as part of their memory and reinterpreting it again. So they are starting a discourse again, a new one. And this is something, the last sentence, I think if you just repatriate recordings, you are starting a discourse, and this discourse is not ending, it's constantly just changing. Um, maybe after 10 years we have to make a re-edition with a completely new booklet, and this is something I would be very happy if it would be so. Yeah. This is a good uh, starting point for the question out of the chat. Uh, um, there's the question. What justification is there for keeping colonial sound archives in the country of the collection? Can energy be redirected to working with curators, archivists from the communities who were collected? How far can Western institutions go to let go of their acquisitions, as uh, Sandeep Bhagwati suggested in mm -hmm. his keynote? So this has partly been uh, um, also answered, but maybe someone else uh, would like to com comment. Can, uh, yeah, why keep it here? That's maybe the question that has not been answered. So uh, it's, for, it's for me or for? I don't know, I mean. We can just, uh, just give you. Maybe a, also. Uh, uh, um, I, will, I will give you one, one short uh, example. I was just talking about uh, South Korean or the Korean recordings. Um, we have uh, back cylinder recordings and they are on negative copper negative forms. So we have to make a recast of the whole thing to reproduce it, to digitize it. Mm -hmm. And our colleagues from South Korea ask us also for the, for the original um, back cylinders. They are not in existing anymore. We have to make copies. Mm -hmm. And uh, they can't play it back because they don't have the equipment. Mm -hmm. Definitely we handed it over, but it just stays here because we have the equipment. We just digitize it and then hand it over to the society. It's just a kind of safeguarding, nothing else. Definitely we are giving it back. And um, as I just said, the original is not existing any longer because it was destroyed during this process of copying it. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Is there uh, a comment uh, here in the, in the hall or a question yeah. here? If I may say something. Huh? Hmm? Sorry. Yeah, please. I'm sorry. Hmm? <laughs> Yeah, the question of re repatriation of the mm -hmm. artifacts, uh, like from, they were taken from Africa back to Europe. One problem is you have to have the facilities that can maintain these artifacts in Africa. Because the whole concept of a, of a museum is not an African concept, it's a because the artwork that they made a long time ago in Africa was utilized. It was daily things. It was not, it was Kunstwerk, but it was also work to use. So you have to have the facilities to uh, retake these materials, also for music, and you have to maybe educate uh, African or Asian musicologists mm. to preserve these works. So I think you have to maybe start there before you give it back, mm. you know? It's not so easy, I think. Mm. Yeah? Just, just yes. add something. Yes. I, I want to, 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 to remind that the recording is not a musical culture. And um, mm. of course, it's the product of, of a research. It's always, a, it's always a, a very small part of something which happened in the larger performance. And I, I, I remember Hornbostel who said in 1905, wir müssen retten was zu, we have to save what is there still to be saved because otherwise everything will be lost. So for him, this material side, this is a Western concept of culture, the material, it's important yeah. to materialize, but of course, uh, so just uh, giving you an answer, what we have here in these archives, these are just 
material representations of something of an intangible nature. So it's much easier, these examples from Lars also, it's much easier to copy, to digitize, to make additions, to, to interact with, uh, with uh, members of those societies, and so on, so on. My last question, and this refers also to, uh, to the Humboldt Forum, which, is, uh, which has a, a great challenge now, because the concept of music, so I'm not sure if putting sound in a dark room without anything, if this is enough to tell people what music is. You know, this, this reminds me, this, the concept of Tonkunst is German. Tonkunst, it is sound art, it's sound as such. The example I gave you from the apartheid was, was clear. I took the, I, I, I gave them back the recordings, but this was not enough. Mm. They would not be happy to be in a dark room just listening to some sounds. Mm. You know? So this concept of what is music at the end, this is, I think this is also one of yeah. many topics of our ongoing discussion. I think it has be become very clear that the archives, uh, that we are just in the beginning of the topic and that we have to get back to this uh, uh, at another uh, time, and uh, that we are just starting, that the, that the archives can only be uh, a starting point, point uh, for um, reflection of uh, um, between the different communities and how to, uh, out of the archive, um, and the epistemologies um, get to a new vision of uh, contemporary music practice. And uh, I'm sure that we have to discuss for longer and s more times <laughs> to uh, find here new concepts. So I thank you very much for joining us uh, today for, the, for this uh, very inspiring panel and uh, hope to, uh, we join again uh, another time. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, first of all. Yeah, thank you.